Good afternoon. I'm Ron French, senior writer and associate editor at Bridge Michigan, a nonprofit, nonpartisan news organization providing Michigan readers with fact driven journalism on the state's diverse people, politics, and economy. On behalf of Dean Michael Barr and the faculty and students of the Ford School of Public Policy, it is a great pleasure to welcome all of you to this Policy Talks event to discuss the profound effects of COVID-19 on the state of education in Michigan. This event is presented by the Ford School in partnership with the Education Policy Initiative, a program within the Ford School that brings together nationally recognized education policy scholars focused on the generation and dissemination of policy relevant education research and is co-sponsored by Bridge Michigan and the University Research Corridor. Today, you'll hear research findings that look at shifts in enrollment numbers, indicators of student learning and qualitative effects of students and families from educators across the state, including Kevin Stang, an associate professor of public policy at the University of Michigan Ford School and faculty co-director of the Education Policy Initiative. Catherine Strunk, the Clifford E. Erickson Distinguished Chair in Education and a professor of education policy at Michigan State University and the faculty director of MSU's Education Policy Innovation Collaborative, a research center devoted to rigorous evidence that improves education policy. And we will also hear from Sarah Linhoff, the Leonard Kaplan Endowed Professor and an Associate Professor of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at Wayne State University. Uh, she is also director of the Education Research Partnership, a collaboration with Detroit schools and community-based organizations to produce research to inform education policy and practice in Detroit. Following these brief presentations, Delsa Chapman, who is Michigan Department of Education Deputy Superintendent of Educator, Student, and School Support, will share her thoughts and then we will convene for a conversation around the long-term implications of these findings and what lessons can be learned from the unique set of challenges presented by the pandemic. We encourage you to engage and ask questions in the YouTube chat box or tweet your questions to hashtag policy talks. There will be time at the end of the live event for these audience questions, including those received in advance. For now though, Please welcome now our first presenter, Kevin Stang, to kick, out the, to kick off this important conversation. Thank you, Ron, for that introduction and for, for teeing up the topic. Um, and thank you to all of you for, for joining us. Um, we, uh, uh, we're going to look at many dimensions of how COVID has affected education in the state of Michigan. I'm going to start off with a, a pretty high level um, uh, overview of, of how Michigan public school enrollment has shifted, and you'll see uh, it has shifted quite dramatically during the pandemic. Um, this is joint work with Tarina Musadik and Andrew Bakker Hicks and Josh Goodman. Um, and I should uh, I provide one uh, disclaimer, which is that we're going to be sharing analysis that uses data from the Michigan uh, Education Data Center, which is uh, uh, at the Ford School, which is obtained uh, through agreement with the Michigan Department of Education and the uh, Michigan Center for Education Performance and Information, um, and that the results are opinions are, are mine um, and they're not uh, those of the states uh, uh, and Dr. Chapman will, will make that clear in her remarks. Um, uh, next slide, please. So first off, um, Michigan, like, like many states across the country, just experienced a enormous drop in enrollment in its public schools during the first year of the pandemic. Um, so in Michigan, uh, in uh, between 2019 and 2020 uh, fall, we saw a 47, 46,000 uh, student drop in enrollment in our public schools across the state. Uh, just this graph here shows enrollment, the average enrollment in each grade um, for you know the three different grade levels, and, and then separately kindergarten. And you can see that the biggest drop is obviously at kindergarten. Um, uh, which experienced something like a 13,000 student drop uh, in this one year. Um, but you saw pretty sizable drops uh, in, in the other elementary school grades, middle school, and then to a lesser extent high school. Uh, just by way of context, you know, Michigan is a state that's been losing population. And so we've been, um, we've sort of had a longer term decline in enrollment in public schools in the state of about 11,000 students per year. So uh, during the first year of the pandemic, 
the state's public school system lost four times uh, the number of students as, as typical, um, or experienced a decline of four times the number of, uh, as, as typical. Uh, next slide, please. This aggregate picture really masks important differences across different communities and different students uh, within our state. Uh, so uh, uh, in particular, there was a enormous, uh, almost 20% drop among black kindergartners across the state uh, in this one year. Um, uh, so almost twice uh, the rate experienced by other race ethnic groups uh, in the state. Um, uh, and, and certainly uh, much greater than, than has ever been seen sort of prior to uh, the pandemic, which is what you see on the, on the, in, the, in the blue bars here. Um, you know, one thing to note is that, you know, again, the, the largest increase was in um, kindergarten uh, and the rates uh, for all students across the board, you could see, uh, which is sort of the left, uh, the left two bars for each of these categories is much uh, smaller than for kindergarten and actually much more uh, evenly distributed across, um, across different uh, race and ethnic groups. Um, so this, uh, this big decline that we've seen really uh, is going to combine two things. It's going to be the effects for students that are would be continuing in school and also for new students. Um, in particular, all kindergartners obviously would be new to uh, the public schools. Um, uh, okay, next slide. And so uh, what we did was to look at, um, we sort of uh, looked at the, um, our data sort of permits us to follow individual students uh, over time and ask among students that were actually enrolled prior to the pandemic, how many return the next year? And um, that's what this graph shows. So we call that the, uh, uh, or the reverse of that is the exit rate. So how many of students that were enrolled in the year before the pandemic uh, were not enrolled in a public school in Michigan uh, the first year of the pandemic during 2020, 2021 um, uh, school year. And so you can see that uh, the, uh, you know, the rate, let me just put one, you know, to, to walk you through one of the numbers here, um, prior to the pandemic, uh, the 4% uh, of kindergartners in public schools in Michigan would not come back uh, for first grade and would not sort of be in the public school system the, the following year for various reasons, families moving out of state, um, uh, 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 homeschooling, you know, a number of reasons they might not be um, uh, coming back. But that rate uh, jumped from 4% up to more than 7.5% uh, in the year of the pandemic. So we saw just a huge increase in number of children that uh, were in kindergarten uh, in the public school system in Michigan prior to the pandemic that uh, were not uh, in the school system for first grade. And what you can see is there's a really sharp gradient by age where there's much larger uh, rates of exit from the public schools in Michigan for younger students. So then the question is, well, where do they go? Uh, next slide, please. Um, so a large number of those students uh, were kept home and were homeschooled um, and not uh, not uh, affiliated with the public school system. So prior to the pandemic, you know, the the of the all the students that sort of didn't return for first grade, less than uh, you know 0.1 percent of them would have been uh, not returning because they were going to be homeschooled. In the first year of the pandemic, that rate was 2%. So more than half of the increase in exit rates of kindergartners um, uh, was accounted for by homeschool. And you can see that the rate of shifting to homeschool is, is much, um, uh, you know, declines as you get older, uh, as the students get older. The, the increase to, or the, the exit for private schooling in the state um, was also very large, unprecedented large shift, um, you know, though smaller than what we saw for homeschooling. And that's what's on the right. So uh, the shift to private school, for instance, accounts for 15% of the exit rate for uh, kindergartners. Um, next slide, please. So one thing that's different when you look at these continuing students is the, uh, the patterns of sort of who's leaving is quite different than, than the aggregate picture that we saw earlier. So uh, overall for elementary school, about 4% of them would have left uh, the public schools uh, uh, pre-pandemic, you know, between years. And uh, during the pandemic, that average was 6.4%. Uh, this is averaging across all the grades in elementary school, um, though obviously we saw some that was concentrated among younger students. Um, but uh, a large, uh, the, the, the much largest, the largest rates of exit, of increase in exit uh, from the public schools during the pandemic was actually among 
white students uh, and those that are not classified as economically disadvantaged. So that pattern is actually very different than what we saw for when looking at kindergarten enrollment. Uh, next slide, please. So just to summarize, the public school enrollment declined substantially in the fall of 2020. We're still waiting for the numbers uh, for, for this uh, fall. Um, uh, it was about 3% or 46,000 uh, students in Michigan, which is a similar rate of decline in other states. So Michigan's not unusual here. Um, and there was a strong age gradient with 11% uh, decline among kindergartners um, and uh, you know, a large increase in uh, the share of students that aren't returning uh, for first grade among kindergartners, and then sizable increases for the other grades. Um, a lot of that was movement to homeschooling. Uh, that accounts for the majority of that, uh, of that shift. Um, importantly, prior attachment to the public school system matters. So kindergarten enrollment declines were concentrated among economically disadvantaged students and black students. Um, declines in other grades uh, for continuing or incumbent students were disproportionately among higher income and white students. So the overall narrative of focusing just on kindergarten, uh, which is the biggest loss, is actually misses this nuance. Um, just some implications. Next slide, please. Uh, so the jury's still out on exactly how this is going to unfold. We're right in the middle of things. Um, and so I hope we'll have a, a, a rich discussion of this uh, in the Q&A. But, um, you know, if students or a large number of them or most of them return, I'm sorry, re remain in al these alternative sectors, then public schools are likely to face really uh, severe funding challenges and uh, particularly um, for uh, women, uh, uh, potentially challenges for labor force participation. Um, if a lot of these students come back, then there's going to be unplanned shifts in cohort size, composition, and students' educational preparation are going to create real uh, sizable uh, organizational challenges and staffing challenges. The, um, the learning implications depends on the quality of the alternatives, uh, and we'll hear a little bit about that um, uh, from Catherine. Uh, homeschooling is largely unregulated, uh, and privates are quite heterogeneous. So um, I think it's a little open question on what the learning implications will be. Um, and there's potential, obviously, for these uh, existing achievement gaps to widen in future years. Um, it also, I think, raises uh, uh, challenges for just assessment and assessment of what's going on. So these large differential changes in student composition across grades is going to raise challenges for comparing um, outcomes across uh, years. And so even for, for tracking what's going on. Um, these are just a couple of the implications, but I hope to, uh, to dig into more as we, uh, as we have the discussion. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having us today. And thank you to the Ford School for hosting this really great discussion. I'm going to talk for a minute about uh, what we're learning at Epic about learning during the pandemic from the benchmark assessment data that were taken during the 2021 school year. I should say this is a huge team effort. We have an amazing crew at Epic, and this was done by both Brian Hopkins and Tara Kilbride, as well as several of our RAs. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. Um, so just wanted to give you a little background about why we even have benchmark assessment scores to learn from during the 2021 school year. Um, under state legislation and the return to learn law that was passed, there was a requirement that districts offered uh, benchmark assessments both in the fall and the spring of the 2021 school year. And the legislation allowed for districts to choose between four different assessment providers, and or they also could choose a, their own locally developed assessment. And I'm going to talk about why that creates a challenge for us in a second. So about 91% of Michigan districts provided some form of their benchmark assessment data to the state for EPIC to analyze. And about 74% of, of districts are actually in our analysis for a number of challenges that we faced in getting the data from the districts in a way that was a usable format. I should also say that we worked a lot with Medic at U of M and with the Michigan Data Hubs to be able to access these data in a clear way. Um, one of the things I'm gonna show you on the next slide is the way that the students in our analysis this year differed from the state K through eight population and differed across vendors. This is a little bit to Kevin's last point about the implications of enrollment last year for understanding what we can learn about the uh, learning during the pandemic for, by the benchmark assessments. In particular, lower income, black and special education students are underrepresented in our analysis. Um, the report required the report was required to identify the number and proportion of students in the state that are significantly behind grade level, quote unquote. That also poses a problem for us in how to learn about these, um, how students fare during the pandemic. So I'm going to walk us through that for a second as well. Uh, next slide. 
Okay, so this is a little bit of a confusing table and I wanna just walk us through it for a second because it's, it's very important. The main point here is that what I said earlier, students in our analysis differ from the overall population of K-8 students in the state and they differ across the different assessment vendors for benchmark assessments. So what you see on that left statewide column uh, we have about 590,000 Michigan students in our sample. This is about 61% of all K through eight students in the state. Um, if you look at that NWA column, we see that the vast majority of the students, so over 440,000 of them, took the NWA map growth assessment. And among districts that use the NWA, we have about 78% of K through eight students in those districts. So again, there's never a district that had 100% participation rate in their benchmark assessment that we were able to use. Um, if you go down to that student characteristics panel, it begins to tell you how the samples differ. So the first row shows you that 62% of students in Michigan and K through eight are economically disadvantaged. This is compared to only 51% in the NWA sample for the districts that took the NWA, 59% um, in the sample that took the curriculum associates iReady assessment, and then 47 and 37% in the STAR and DRC districts. Uh, black students were underrepresented in the NWA districts, but also especially in the STAR and DRC districts. You can see the 5% of students in those districts that took the assessment were Black, 1% in DRC. iReady was overrepresented in Black students, in part because some of the big urbans, especially Detroit public schools, took the iReady assessment. Similarly, you can see the variation here in the Hispanic or Latino populations that took the assessment by vendor, special education, and English learners. This has implications for how we can understand the analysis that we're about to show you. Because what we know from the, from the pandemic is that a lot of the students who are less likely to test were also less likely to um, have positive experiences during the pandemic. They are often lower income. They often live in urban areas, in areas that were harder hit by the economics of the pandemic, by the health, health issues about the pandemic. And so we, we know from other research that these are the exact students who did even worse during the pandemic, and they're underrepresented in our analysis. Next slide, please. Okay, another challenge about how do we learn from the pandemic? Uh, when you have four different assessment vendors, you have to do four different analyses. You can't compare across the different vendors. This is because every vendor has a different definition of significantly behind grade level. And it's also because every vendor tests different things and does it in different ways. And so I'm gonna focus on the NWA and the curriculum associates, associates uh, outcomes for this presentation, mostly because they are the largest samples and also because um, we have the most information about how those students fared, would have fared in other years. Next slide, please. Okay, so here are some results, finally. Um, this is the NWA map growth uh, district. So you can see in the green, you have the fall benchmark and spring benchmark and then the change. This again is for the NWAs, what they, how they define significantly behind grade level which was when they would say that if a student was projected to score not proficient at the end of the year on the M step, they would be significantly behind grade level. This is important because it's different from the other vendors. And so what NWA does is using a Michigan sample from the pre-pandemic, they said, if you take a test in the fall, based on how you're doing right now, how would we expect you to do at the end of the year? And then in the spring, how would we expect you to do at the end of the year? So we would expect positive changes here. And we see that for the most part. In the blue columns, you see what we know from the statewide MSTEP data, both in 2019 and 2021, pre-pandemic and during the pandemic. The 2021 data, again, have an underrepresentation of students who took the test in about the same way as the benchmark sample does. And so we know that those are probably under uh, overestimates of the progress that students made in 2021. What you can see is, let's take an example from the top sample in math in third grade. In, in the fall of 20. Uh, 2020, we know that about 35% of students who took the NWA math growth assessment in math uh, scored, would have, they predicted would have scored not proficient at the end of the year. This grew to 39% of students who took it. So 4% more students uh, scored at the end of the year, not proficient than would have been expected. Um, you can compare that to pre-pandemic the, in 2019 and the M step. And you see that about 28% of students in third grade scored not proficient on the math M step. So that's a pretty substantial difference between 39% and 28%. Similarly in reading, if you look at the third grade reading, about 29% of students scored below uh, not proficient 
in the fall and 35% were projected to score not proficient in the spring, which is a 6% increase in students and is again higher than the 30% that scored not proficient in 2019. So what we're seeing is that there's actually over the course of the year, slower learning growth than we would have expected over the course of the year. And, and students ended up the school year, um, more students ended up not proficient than we would have expected given pre-pandemic trends. Next slide, please. Here we see it for the Curriculum Associates iReady scores. And uh, this one does something different. You take a test in the fall and it's on a set of, of standards that you're supposed to know in say second grade or third grade. And you take a test in the spring on the same set of standards supposed to know in second or third grade. And you would expect that by the end of the year, um, you would have fewer students who are significantly behind grade level because they've learned something over the course of the year. And this is what you see here. Um, we also have a sample from 2018-19 from iReady uh, of Michigan students who took the test. So we can compare what that looked like in 2018-19 to the sample that took the test in 2020-21. Um, the way they define significantly behind grade level is if they think you are two or more grade levels behind standards. And what you can see is, I'm gonna focus on those change columns. And again, I'll look at third grade math. You can see that about 15 percentage point more, um, more student, fewer students were scoring two or grade levels or behind in third grade math. But the Delta over the course of a typ typical school year pre-pandemic in third grade was like a 26% difference. And 25% of kids ended up um, in third grade ended up scoring two or more grade levels behind in math in the spring, as opposed to just 14% in the 2019 spring. Same things for reading. And so you're seeing you know, across the board that we have um, much slower rates of growth over the 2019-20 school year than we had in 2018-19. Next slide. Here's a kind of key takeaways, and I'm just gonna repeat myself for a second, but we had a slower rate of learning than, during the 2019-20 school year than we did in a pre-pandemic school year. Um, we don't know as much about the students though who are non-white, who are low income and who are eligible for special education. And so we have to assume that this is even probably worse than we, the picture that we're painting with these data. We do have a report coming out in January, early January, um, following up on this one, that's actually gonna look at the achievement gaps between different race, ethnicities, genders, um, special education students and students without disabilities, et cetera, to be able to understand um, how the gaps might have changed by the in, in the tested sample over the course of the year. Um, but, we, but we probably we have to kind of realize the equity implications here. And I think that those are really critical for us to think about. So um, the, one of the main equity implications that I wanna bring forward, and I think Sarah will talk about this a little bit in the next presentation, is that these are we have to think about the students who are the most impacted by the pandemic and what we can and cannot know about them. And if we make the assumption that what we're seeing here is sort of a best case scenario, then we probably want to understand how we can work to accelerate learning for students who are most impacted by the pandemic in the future years. We'd all hope that this year would be sort of a back to normal school year, which it hasn't been. And so we have to assume that the students who are probably most impacted last year are being again impacted by staffing shortages, um, COVID requirements to get schools or classrooms or individual students out of the classroom for a given amount of time. And so I think that we're going to have to assume that we're going to build two years of interrupted learning and how we're going to accelerate students at the end of it. Thank you very much. And I think I'll turn it over to Sarah. Thanks, Catherine. Um, really appreciate being here. Thanks so much to the Ford School for having me. Um, so I'm Sarah Lindhoff. I'm the director of Detroit of the Detroit Education Research Partnership at Wayne State University. And our partnership is focused on producing research to inform decision making around education issues in Detroit. And we partner with Detroit Public Schools Community District and charter schools in Detroit, as well as community based organizations to do our work. And we have a lot of areas that we cover, but the, the biggest one is related to student attendance and absenteeism. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the, the impact of COVID-19 on Detroit families in general, as well as how COVID shaped student attendance last year. And the reason why attendance matters is because there's essentially a linear relationship between the number of days students go to school and their performance outcomes on student tests, as well as socio-emotional outcomes. 
And when students are chronically absent, meaning they miss 10% or more enrolled school days or severely chronically absent, 20% or more school days, they have much worse outcomes both academically, they're much less likely to graduate, and they have worse socio-emotional outcomes. So we're interested in chronic absence because we know that enrollment and attendance issues were big issues during the pandemic as students were learning online, but also because chronic absence is, is a useful indicator for understanding student well-being in general um, and understanding what, what supports students and families might need. So let's dig into our data. You can turn to the next slide. So we administered a, um, a randomized survey of DPSCD families at the end of last school year in June 2021. And we were trying to understand how did COVID impact um, students and their families over this last school year. And then we linked their responses to their students' attendance records. So um, DPS was a great partner in this. And I really thank uh, Jason Rose, the director of research of the district, for helping us administer this survey and, um, and link those student attendance records. So Detroit had really high rates of chronic absence before the pandemic. Um, about 62% of students were chronically absent prior to the pandemic. And last year, 70% were chronically absent with about 54% in that severe chronic absence category. In addition to that, over a quarter of students last year missed more than half of their enrolled school days. So uh, an important distinction to make is this is different than the data that are, were reported to the state last year when um, students just needed to have two two-way interactions a week in order to be counted as present. This is daily attendance records, so it's comparable uh, to the to prior years. So um, we saw similar patterns in in terms of student demographics and attendance um, and student grades, but one exception was in 12th grade where about 87% of students were chronically absent in 12th grade last year. So really important, you know, we, we don't have the, the graduation data from Detroit yet from this past school year, but I'm really interested in what are the potential implications on that really high absence rate in 12th grade for graduation and then college um, admission. Next slide. So we, we wanted to look at, we know that prior chronic absence is a strong predictor of current year chronic absence. So we wanted to compare, you know, who were the students who were chronically absent before the pandemic and what happened in that pandemic year last year? And, you know, did students sort of stay in their chronic absence category or did they shift? So we saw about 3,000 students, about 9% of that population that we have in 1819 and 2021 became not, you know, weren't chronically absent when they were the, the year before the pandemic, but 21% of those students became chronically absent. So they had better attendance before the pandemic, and then now they're missing a lot of days. And the major explanation for that shift is around internet and computer, um, both access, but also just problems with computers. So when we surveyed families, we asked them, you know, what are the challenges to student attendance this uh, this school year? And families were saying, you know, 30 and 34 percent of them were saying that computer uh, computer issues and the internet were causing problems in logging on to online school. Next slide. We also interviewed families last school year in Detroit, and they talked about the intersection between online learning and socioeconomic sort of conditions in their families and employment. Um, so I wanted to share a few quotes from, um, from families that we heard from. So one mom told us, you know, I'm still unemployed. I'm still looking for work. I'm trying to look for a job on the weekend or maybe a night shift so I can be there for the kids for their online schooling because I'm a single mom. I'm the only person they have to help them. So this shows how, you know, being online created these challenges for kind of logging on to school, but also intersected with other difficulties of the pandemic for Detroit families. Um, another mom told us that she was laid off her job because she had to take off work to help her kids with their online learning. And then we also heard about the, the mental health challenges related to online learning. And, 
how those um, disruptions um, created problems with with academic learning, as Catherine just shared with us. So, you know, this mom told us um, her children are telling her that they can't focus. They're having too hard of a time um, focusing, concentrating. She said the mental health aspect is difficult for, for them. So something to keep in mind as we move on to the next slide, which showed that across the board, kind of no matter what the attendance rates were, there were really high rates of hardship among Detroit families. So across the board, you know, 50% of more than 50% of families were facing mental health challenges, financial challenges, and logistical challenges last school year. And, um, you know, about 65% um, of, of families across the board had parents who lot, lost their job or worked less hours last year, you know, creating more economic instability. Um, in addition to that, in the severely chronically absent category, which again, this is more than half the students in the district, 13% of those families were evicted last year, even though there was an eviction ban. So you can imagine how high that number would be um, had we not had that national ban. Next slide. So I want to pull back a little bit to think about, you know, we 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 kind of painted this picture of the COVID challenges last year, and they were immense for families, especially related to computer issues and getting online for, for virtual school. But our prior research uh, is reinforced by the survey data that shows that there are major socioeconomic differences between students who are not chronically absent and students who have absence um, issues or who are severely chronically absent. So you can see big differences in, in income where, you know, not chronically absent students have an average income of 30, around 36,000 versus 18,000 for severely chronically absent students. We also see major differences in, um, in education level, in employment, and it, I really want to point to these differences in regular working hours or stable working hours. This is something that was emphasized in our qualitative research as well, where families would, would share that when they have unpredictable working schedules, it makes it challenging to get their children to school. And that was sort of exacerbated with the pandemic with children being you know, at home, having to log on online. Um, next slide. So what are the implications of all this? Um, you know, there are systemic challenges that create barriers to school attendance even before the pandemic, and many of those were exacerbated during it. So we had high rates of, um, of unemployment and job loss. We had instability related to, to health. Um, you know, over 35% of our families lost someone or had someone who was severely sick from COVID this past school year. So those um, those challenges and the, and the kind of inequality built into those challenge, challenges creates um, the conditions where it's really difficult for many students to get to school. And, and that was mirrored in the in the COVID school year. Um, we, we know that, you know, there was this major investment in computers and hotspots in Detroit, but we heard from families that it didn't, you know, those resources didn't always kind of match their needs. There were hardware challenges. Um, the, some of the computers weren't very high quality. There were kind of tech support issues. So, uh, you know, in a year where we're still seeing kids, you know, online learning through quarantine in, in Detroit, we have virtual Fridays through December um, to mitigate COVID. So these issues are still present and we really need to figure out how to better support families through, um, through online learning and to, you know, mi mitigate COVID to the extent we can so kids are back in school in person. Um, and then my last point, and, and I always just think this is so important to, to think about, is how you know, schools have a really important role to play here in reducing um, chronic absence and improving the conditions for school attendance, but they can't do it alone. So social sectors and government agencies across students' educational ecosystems have a really important role to play in reducing 
barriers to school attendance and creating additional pathways to student success. Um, that was true before the pandemic. It's even more true now. Um, and we've seen some evidence that, you know, we can coordinate with city governments, with health departments and, and other social service agencies to provide students and schools with what they need. We, I, I, I think this research really reinforces the importance of continuing and building on that work in the years to come. So my last slide is just a thank you to our partners and our funders um, and uh, encouragement to visit our website. We'd love your feedback on our work. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists, um, Dr. Stein, Dr. Strunk, and Dr. Leanhoff. Um, very humbled and thankful for this opportunity just to reflect on the on the findings, on the research that was conducted. Um, here in the state of Michigan, yes, we, we have been in the trenches. We have had to push through and are still pushing through the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and very specifically on our children. Um, reflecting on the data presented by Dr. Stein in terms of um, the decline in enrollment, um, four times what our general trend has been over the last several years is concerning. And so we do actively have, um, through <coughs> contact here at the state level, we are concerned and we would like to know where are the students? Have they um, chosen to matriculate or to move to another state? Or are these children in our communities and not being educated at all. So that's of grave concern. And that is a focus that um, through our state agency and our resources that we would want to support our local education agencies with. In addition to that, I'm focusing very heavily um, in my reflection on the data that Dr. Strunk presented regarding um, benchmark assessment. Many have stated that students have lost learning. The opportunity to learn was interrupted. You can't lose what you did not have. And so if you did not have that opportunity to learn because of the pandemic, we have moved forward here in the Michigan Department of Education to put together resources which are continuous, not just a one and done. Um, through the division um, that I oversee, the Division of Educator, Student, and School Supports, we are really advocating for our local education agencies to be involved with our accelerated learning initiative. Because as Dr. Strunk presented, the rate of achievement was slower. In, in addition to that, the data that she presented also indicates that we did not have a full scope and sequence of all students at all grade levels in all demographic groups to know where we truly are. So through the supports that are being put together and pushed out um, through the Michigan Department of Education, strong focus on accelerated learning. Many are asking, how can you accelerate? You accelerate by meeting the student where they are in focusing through standards, through content-driven standards on how to move them forward. And that, and that is what we um, have been doing, lots of support. <clears throat> and this is not just uh, initiative germane to the state of Michigan. We have collaborated um, with um, chiefs across um, the nation through CCSSO and others. And we are definitely on the right track in supporting our educators and our students. The data that really um, tugs at the heart is what Dr. Leanhoff presented as a result of the survey um, and the findings associated with the Detroit Public Community School District. As she reported, attendance or the lack thereof being chronic or severely chronic was very high even before the onset of the pandemic. So we do know that we have a lot of work across the state to address chronic absenteeism. And how we do that is focusing on student engagement, making sure that our families are engaged by supporting and educating our parents 
on in this moment, during the pandemic, after the pandemic, how we can support them to better support their children as learners. And we would not leave out our educators. And so it is the responsibility of us as the state agency to make sure that our educators are being developed professionally so that they can help move forward the learning um, that has been not lost, but interrupted so that they are well equipped to move our young people forward here in the state of Michigan. So I would collectively say that um, as a state in this educational realm, we need to, yes, focus on support through acceleration. We also need to make sure that we are supporting the mental health of our parents, students, and educators. And it takes a village, right? So this should be a, an all hands on deck, everyone involved, and most of all, it should be done through equitable means. It should, our data should not be showing um, at the rate it is of the impact of those that are economically disadvantaged, but the data talks, right? It speaks. And so we do need to collectively unite and make sure that there is equitable access to connectivity, to learning, to support for all of our students. And those are my reflections. And at this time, uh, we will turn it over to uh, Mr. French. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Um, and, and thank you for all the panelists. Um, uh, it's, it's fascinating, uh, if, if a bit, uh, at times depressing information that we're hearing today about the challenges that uh, our schools are facing and our, and our students and families are facing. Um, I know there's a lot of talk um, over the, uh, the, the past few months about infrastructure, about the, what we need to do uh, with, the, you know, the, with at the federal level that they you know about all the, all the how we could spend money on infrastructure. Well, I, I think that that I think what this presentation uh, uh, brings to light for me even more than has in the past how how, how education is infrastructure too. Um, that we need to to consider it that way and fund it and and um, figure out how to uh, make things work as best we can, just as much as we uh, need uh, to fill the potholes on our roads. Um, we're gonna open up for questions here soon. And so if you have any questions, um, start uh, asking them. And, uh, but I'm gonna start with a few questions of my own if I can. Um, um, Kevin, if we can go to you first, when you talk about um, um, uh, kindergartners and are there, you know, if, if in businesses, if, if you lose a customer, you often don't get them back. And I, I'm wondering if you are aware of any historical parallels when students left public, the public school system in this sort of level and, and whether they returned. Um, and in the same, same breath, I guess, uh, whether any states, I know we don't have uh, uh, data yet for Michigan, but are there states out there that have, have um, any indication yet this fall as to whether the, especially like the kindergarten numbers, whether they're bouncing back? You know, I, um, let me answer that the second question first. Um, and I, I actually, let me take the opportunity to just thank the other the panelists for the, the great sort of um, presentation and, and uh, Dr. Chapman for your uh, bringing it all together. And I think, you know, I think reminding us that um, I particularly, you know, our work, you know, is very high level and, People are just numbers, and actually, what um, you know, and highlighting that sort of Sarah's point really brings home, or Sarah's work really brings home that like these numbers are, are families and and communities and students and children and their learning. Um, so, so to answer your your question, Ron, I think um, I am not aware. Yeah, I mean, I think we're still kind of waiting. Um, I'm not aware of sort of even early kind of evidence. Um, that's coming out from other states that would really be able to answer like how much of this is persisting versus uh, bouncing back. Um, I mean, I've seen some news reports that have suggested that things aren't getting any better um, this current year. And I think there's been, uh, you know, obviously a movement back towards more in-person instruction, but there's just been a lot of uncertainty and um, uh, around that, um, that, that I think may be keeping some uh, 
some parents holding back. So I don't have a great answer. Um, I, I guess what I do know is I think, um, uh, and, and this kind of gets to, to, to Dr. Chapman's point, is I think there are, what, what I take away from our, re, our work is that there are just many reasons why stu uh, families are uh, somewhat disengaging from the public school system, their own personal circumstances, the circumstances of the school and the district, their employment situation, the child care centers are closing, like all of those factors are kind of underpinning some of the patterns that we're finding. And, um, and so I think there are many reasons sort of why families are disengaging. And so I think re-engaging uh, families in the public system is going to require many different strategies. And, and um, uh, you know, and, and there might be different sort of strategies that are going to work in different communities, um, depending on the particular circumstances there. Um, so that's kind of a non-answer, but that's the best I can do uh, for now. No, that's that's okay. That's okay. You're being honest about uh, the limitations of what you're working with at the moment, and I appreciate it. Uh, speaking of limitations, I think Catherine spoke to that a little bit about that with her data. Um, um, I, I loved how her caveats were, were about as long as, uh, as as the data presentation, and 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 I know that's that's tough to tough to to deal with. Um, Catherine, can you give because I, I think a lot of uh, a fair number of people on uh, listening here. Um, are um, very familiar with 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 uh, education data and and with schools in general, and I'm and I'm wondering if if you have a sense because again this year isn't exactly a normal year either. Um, how long is it going to be? I, I'll ask it like a like uh, like the layman that I am. How long is it going to be before we know the real effect on learning um, from the pandemic? Uh, I'm going to look at my magic eight ball and shake it for a second and see what I come up with. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I think a lot depends on what happens this year. So one of the beauties of having a standardized achievement test like the MSTEP that's repeated year after year on the same set of standards is that we can get a snapshot at the end of each year about how students are doing on standards in Michigan at each grade level. Um, and of course, and we didn't have that in 1920 for obvious reasons. And we had a limited look at that in 2021. Um, there was legislation from the legislature again this year that it requires benchmark assessments to occur again this fall and spring and next fall and spring. EPIC is partnering with MDE to continue studying these districts that took the benchmark. So hopefully we'll get a trajectory over time and be able to understand if there was an increased learning gain this year relative to last year. And next year, we'd hope to see an even greater increase in learning gain. Um, there's a couple of concerns though. So standardized tests can only measure so much. Um, they can't measure what students are learning that are not on the test. They can't measure things that we want kids to learn in social sciences every year, science, you know, all the other subjects that are very important. Um, the social skills, we've all heard from educators this year that kids are coming back very different than they were pre-pandemic in terms of their ability to be in the classroom and social skills. And those are things that we won't know from the kind of quantitative data that we all are working with. And, and Sarah, your, your, your research on, on uh, chronic absenteeism in Detroit uh, is, is so compelling. It just tugs at my heart. Um, I, I'm wondering if, if um, you can speak for a minute about what, you've, what you know, either from, from surveys or, or from, from just being in the field. What is it that parents need that schools can actually provide that would, 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 would help the situation? Well, I think the answer to that is a little bit different if we're talking about virtual school versus regular school. So um, if you had asked me that question two years ago, I would have said, you know, the, we've talked to, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of families and we've done this survey research and um, we've talked to attendance agents and others in the school district and transportation is always the number one thing that parents ask for and say is a barrier to school attendance. You know, I, I came into this research for the COVID year thinking that transportation wouldn't be that relevant, but we had a lot of students in, in DPS who were still going to school in person for at least part of the year last year, or were going to learning centers in school buildings. They were, they were you know, in virtual education at school buildings. So transportation was still a relevant concern last year. Um, that's a big one. I think, um, you know, as we saw in the in the socioeconomic data that I shared, just kind of comparing this, those severely chronically absent students versus not, 
to me, that really points to there being something distinct between the students who are kind of just over the chronic absence threshold and who, you know, probably if they go to school a few extra days through student engagement initiatives like Delsa was talking about through, um, you know, programs that, you know, focus on, you know, really enticing instructional material and, you know, that kind of thing could really help those students. But more than half of the students are way over that, right? They're missing 36 days or more a school year. And so, you know, programs like that, uh, you know, ev evidence from other places, evidence from Detroit suggests that those aren't the kind of things that are going to kind of close that gap. It's really going to require, you know, major investments in like social social supports in you know you using dhhs workers to support families make sure that they have their basic needs met make sure that students have access to schools close to home i mean that that's part of what creates this transportation problem is that many students in detroit have to go really far away from home to access a school um and so you know i think it's it's complex i think that there's going to be multiple solutions that need to be added together to, to make some real progress. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Chapman, um, I know that you're you, you not technically on the panel, okay, but I'd love to ask you a question if that's okay. Um, you, you mentioned accelerated learning uh, is something that, that, that is, is a focus this year and, and completely understandable. Um, but, but talk to me like, um, like the uh, uh, non-professor that I'm not, uh, that, that I'm not <laughs> and, and, and if, if you can do accelerated learning this year, why don't you do it every year? What, what's the, what, 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 what's different? I believe that, um, it is now very much intentional okay. and it's, it's intentional, but with it being intentional, just like our educators across the state had to learn how to teach virtually, had to learn how to set up a Google Classroom, if you will. Mm -hmm. We cannot expect that our educators are going to just naturally acclimate to that. And so that's why we have worked very hard to basically um, put together a framework of support so that we're not just suggesting that they accelerate it, but we want them to know how to accelerate it. And that, and that has been the focus. And we have had more than we could have imagined to jump on board with that. Um, because we are a local control state, accelerated learning is not something that we can mandate, but we have been doing very strong reach out to districts to support them as we move that forward. Perfect. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that explanation. We have a few audience questions, and I'm going to throw this out to whoever wants to wants to jump in. Um, first audience question um, is specifically looking at the impact uh, this has had on, um, I would say, 11th and 12th graders. You know, it says, what about the effects on high school students, particularly factors like dropout rates, FAFSA completion and enrollment and post-secondary education? How can districts or the Department of Education, or for that matter, uh, policy at the legislator level, um, what can they, what can it be happen to help those kids who have really struggled this in the past uh, 18, 19 months now? Again, and I, this is probably just the, the teacher in me, and coming um, to the state department with nearly 30 years of experience at a local district level. I was in a district at the onset of the pandemic and our kindergarten students and our juniors and seniors were of a heavy focus. You, once again, it's all about intentionality. So rather than um, school counselors and student advocates focusing on what we would consider consider normal activities, districts across the state have had to partner with um, educational organizations such as um, MCAN or those agencies that thrive and focus and key in on our juniors and seniors. We need to be making sure that there are community efforts on FAFSA workshops, you know, as a community across the state. What are we doing? But we also, I would strongly say, would need to work with our um, post-secondary institutions so that there can be some flexibility 
as it relates to the college admissions process. Our students should not be penalized for us being in a pandemic and we have to creatively support them and prepare them to not only to be college ready, but opportunity ready. Thank you. Um, this may be a question for Sarah, but, but uh, anyone jump in. Uh, um, I, another question from the audience, is there a need for a larger federal role in improving urban school districts such as Detroit, Grand Rapids, Lansing, Flint? And, 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 and could it be a, a, it says, could it be a more neutral role such as including physical infrastructure to take pressure off those districts overall budgets? Now, I know there's a lot of, of, of COVID relief money, particularly in some of the urban districts. Uh, so maybe that refers to some of it, but, but uh, Sarah, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, my first thought is yes, for sure. Um, more more money means better outcomes for kids in general um, in schools. So yes, um, I you know I know in Detroit it, we're we're about to embark on major you know facilities upgrades and a multi year facility strategy. Many of our buildings need major repairs, especially in light of COVID and knowing that we need upgrades to you know, air filtration and other systems like that. So I think those sorts of things seem like great investments, especially now, given given what we know about COVID. Um, you know, and I also think that the, the federal money is a really important opportunity for districts to try things that they normally do not have the funds to try to, to kind of create proof points that can motivate state lawmakers to invest in those sorts of things. So that, you know, we're, that's what we're talking about and what's happening in, in DPS right now is they're really working to innovate around attendance this year, you know, doing a bunch of new initiatives to see what works and we're, you know, partnering with them to evaluate them so that we can say, okay, these are the things we need to scale and we need extra investment to, to do them for more students. Thank you. Uh, this may be a question for Catherine, but if it's not, uh, Catherine, just point at somebody else. Um, do, what, what do we know about how districts have accounted for the provision of services for students with disabilities in the ELL? Do we know what's happened during the pandemic with that? We, we know a little bit, but not a lot, at least as far as I know. And Delsa, maybe you have a better sense. Um, what MDE worked closely with CEPI and EPIC during the pandemic to put out a survey that districts had to answer each month about the kind of modality that they were using to instruct students, but also any special services they were providing to special populations of students, including students disabilities and English learners. Um, so we know that there were a number of districts, I mean, I would say probably a majority of districts, if I remember the numbers correctly, that were saying they are providing extra services to students with disabilities and to English learners, fewer for English learners than for students with disabilities, but that's probably a reflection of the population in the state. Um, we don't know as much this year about if districts are providing anything extra service-wise to students with disabilities um, or English learners. And I think it's a pretty important and a very, very important question to understand how are we making sure that we're not only accelerating lear learners for general education, but how are we accelerating learning for special education and English learners? Can I can I add to that? Um, Please. One one um, one finding I didn't I didn't share was that the increased exit rates from public schools um, were much much smaller for students that were identified as English language learners or special ed oh. than typical. Um, and to me, I, to me actually, what that says is you know. Schools are just such a public, the public schools are such a lifeline for students that have those needs, right? And that, uh, I mean, the, 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 there was no increase actually in exit rates for English language learners. Um, and because they don't have a choice, right? Uh, uh, they don't, you know, the, the private schools don't sort of provide those, those, those services nearly as well. I mean, that's my interpretation. Um, uh, or those aren't even an option for many families. Um, uh, homeschooling resources maybe are not uh, also appropriate for, for students that have those special needs. And same thing for students with broader set of um, uh, special education needs. And so, what I, I mean, what I interpret that as meaning that, you know, these, these schools are really a lifeline for those services and that those are not available sort of more broadly in, in on, you know, out, out there outside the schools. Um, even more critical that, you know, these schools are supported. Oh, that's a very good point. Um, Here's a here's a very important question, um, very timely, unfortunately, for Michigan. It's about mental health. 
Um, and so I'm going to throw this out and whoever, whoever feels comfortable um, talking about it, I'd, I'd love to, we'd, I'm sure we'd love to hear from about it. What should school districts be putting in place to support the greater emotional needs of our students to process this pandemic and, and everything they've been living through? And, how, and, and related to that, how realistic is it for schools to take on this burden? Anyone want to take a shot at that? I'll start. It's it's realistic for every district across the state, Ron, if it's embraced. It is our reality. It's not something that we can set aside. There are many that believe that that's not the school's responsibility. That's the family or that's the home responsibility. However, I go back to say it takes a village and many times the structures, the supports that are intentionally put in place at the school then engage and help to educate the caregiver at home. And so when it's intentional and it's embraced, um, it, 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 it will be beneficial. We talked about funding. I would strongly recommend for the funding that has been provided to us um, by the federal um, support that we have, there should be heavy investment in, in mental health. It's very important. And not only run the mental health of our students, but also support for our educators themselves. So important. But the key thing is, is that it has to be acknowledged or recognized and then embraced. Delsa, Del, is your department seeing any indications of increases in uh, um, mental health stresses? I don't know how you how to phrase it, but but among staff. Um, are you specifically asking at the school level or from at, within the state agency itself? <laughs> uh, no, I'm thinking at the school level. Whether, okay. whether, yeah. I'm, yeah. I, I have no doubt you're stressed. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to make sure I understood what you were asking, Ron. But no, 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 no. seriously, um, yes, there there has been an in, in this that it has not just been an increase for the um 2021 school year at the onset of the pandemic. The stress was there and it just increased over time. Okay, good. Um but the, there was a question I had uh, to follow up with, with Sarah, uh, if, if I could ask uh, quickly. Uh, when you, when you um, look at the uh, absentee rate, absent, uh, absenteeism rates in Detroit, and I'm sure this is right at your fingertips, is it seems shockingly high, but for uh, public's point of view, I have no idea if that's a normal type of rate for, for urban low-income uh, public school systems. Uh, is, is, is Detroit out of the ordinary for uh, around the country? Detroit's out of the ordinary. <laughs> so the average chronic absence rate of, of, across the nation is around 10 to 15 percent. For urban school districts, it's more like 25 percent. And in Detroit, for the past decade, it's been around 50 percent. So much higher even than other urban school districts. We've Our prior work has shown how um, kind of environmental correlates are, are uh, kind of create the conditions for school attendance, things like poverty, unemployment, crime, health disparities, and those things are also more challenging in Detroit than in other places. So, you know, in some ways it's it's not a huge surprise, but at the same time, you know, even compa compared to cities like like Cleveland, for instance, we're much higher than that. So so there's there's still a, a gap to be made up and, and work to be done for sure. And Catherine, a quick follow up with you. Um... Um, I know we've spoke a few times uh, about uh, the excellent work uh, your, your, your team does. Um, looking specifically at the sort of data that has come out of test data uh, this past year, um, from a parent's point of view, when, when they see scores from, for their uh, individual student or for, for their individual school, would, would you recommend they take that with a, a, a bit of a grain of salt this year more than, than, than normal? 
Absolutely. Uh, I think it's really important. So thank you, Ron, for bringing that up. We've talked about it before, I know. Um, you know, the, the test taking rate was very different across different districts and even across different schools within districts. And so while there was no waiver this year from the Federal Department of Education on M steps or on benchmarks, um, districts did different things to encourage or not students to come in and take it. And students who are learning remotely were not expected to come into a school building to take a test. And so that means that in certain districts, there was like an eight to 10% testing rate and in other districts, it was more like 90%. And so as a parent, what I do is I think about if I have a test score for my child and I do, I have two fourth graders who, who took the test in third grade last year and is able to look and say, what proportion of the standards did they know by the end of the year as measured by the M step? But I wasn't going to try to take the district as a whole and say, let's compare it to district X, Y, or Z, because we don't know who took the test in each district. Perfect. Um, we have time for one more question. It's a really good one. And I, I'm hoping to hear just a little bit from each of you on this. Um, um, but I'm going to have a buzzer uh, here for, for if anyone <laughs> talks more than 90 seconds. How about that? Um, when, you, when you think of, all, of, of, of everything schools have been through and, and the way they've really had to just like build this plane while it's in the air some, in some situations, um, what changes in the education system that have come out of uh, the pandemic, do you think might remain for years to come? Kevin, let's start with you and then we'll, we'll work around the, the, the horn here. Sure. Um, actually, I'm going to go back to uh, one of the first questions, which is uh, was about sort of high school students and their transition to call potential transition to college. Um, yeah, that's an area that I actually work a bit more in. Um, so I think what we what we have seen is is uh, a I think a greater appreciation for the challenges of um, like standardized testing uh, as determining college admissions. Um, uh, I think we've I think developed a greater appreciation for um, the importance of financial uh, barriers and and inequities in that uh, to college access. And so. Uh, Michigan um, has made a number of changes that have addressed uh, some of those challenges. Um, and institutions around Michigan have addressed some of those challenges. And, um, and, and, and as have institutions and states around the country. And I think some of that's not going away. Um, I think uh, you know, there's sort of a, a, a greater emphasis on making college more affordable and appreciation for um, right. you know, making the you know, access to aid more easier to, 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 to get. Um, so in Michigan, we have a, um, a really important uh, uh, free college plan for students that were uh, on Medicaid when they were in uh, K through 12, um, that we've made some progress in making it sort of easier to access. Um, and, in, and that's happening around the country. And I think that's, a, I think that's something that's probably not going away. I mean, in a, in a, and I say that in a good way. So maybe this is ending this, this discussion with some positives, right? Um, uh, I think an appreciation for um, for those challenges and changes in policy to ac accommodate them, I think, is is one area where I hope is is not going away. Yeah, yeah, I, I think we can all agree on that. Sarah, you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that COVID has created a real interest in digging underneath the hood <laughs> about what's going on with students and their families and has forced this kind of deeper relationship between the home and the school that was always there. But I think often ed policy researchers and ed policy makers try to pretend that it doesn't exist, right? They, they kind of pretend that they can just, if they do everything right in the school building, then all the other social ills will be taken care of. And I think COVID is just a spotlight on the fact that that's not how society works. That's not how people work. Children learn throughout their entire experience at home, at school, outside. And so, you know, to put it in, in Kevin's words, I, I think to me it's a it's a positive thing to take away from this moment that there's been a spotlight on that connection and it's you know an opportunity for schools to be innovative about how they, you know, support families across their their lives and 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 you know, help students succeed. Catherine, what do you think? Well, I want to stay on the optimistic perspective, but I'm not sure that I can. <laughs> um, 
I'll build a little bit off of what Sarah was talking about. I think that um, one of the good things is I think parents and communities have gotten more involved. So I think that they have realized sort of the importance of school, not just for academic learning, but for the general health of the child over and, the, and of the community, to be honest. And so I think that's become great. And I think that's good that we have a greater understanding of that. Um, I do worry that we're going to see extended staffing shortages that are going to emerge from this. So the data aren't really in yet. The data that are in nationally aren't showing the kind of huge decline in staffing that we were worried about initially. But we are seeing some serious shortages in Michigan um, across the state and in specific parts of the state. And I worry that uh, this is not making education look like a more fun place to be uh, at the end of the pandemic. So that's a concern I have. And the second one is um, virtual education. So I think that we've seen this year districts are more willing to go virtual for a day or for a week than they would have been maybe two years ago. And not all kids learn well that way. And so I think we need to think a lot about if we're gonna really continue to rely on remote instruction as a regular part of our school year. Dr. Chapman, you wanna bring us home? Sure. Um, I actually, this is, I actually started a, a journal and I called it pandemic positives. So this is um, a really good for me to be able to end our discussion today. Um, reflecting on what um, Sarah and Kevin shared, there are some positives that have come out, um, but also coupling that with the concern that, that Catherine has in what is really, really a focus right now here at the department is the teacher shortage. We have been successful in being able to share a proposal um, with our legislators specific to teacher recruitment and retention. And I believe that is, is going to be one of the pandemic positives as we get that support so that we can make this great state of Michigan um, an opportunity to continue to move the education profession forward. Innovation in the classroom, yes, um, that is coming to play. And I don't believe that that is going to change. Many are still asking, when will we get back to being normal? I will conclude by saying, this is our new normal and we must grace in it, all work together and move forward. Well, thank you. And, and, and thank you to all our panelists for just a really engaging and timely conversation and, and to our audience for posing just just fantastic questions. Um, you know, this is this this topic is a passion of mine, as it is for all of you. Um, on behalf of the Ford School, I also welcome you to stay tuned to their website and social media pages for more information about upcoming events at the Ford School. Thank you very much and have a good evening. <laughs>